Well, good afternoon. Hello and welcome to this uh, lunch hour lecture, um, which is um, uh, given by Alan Hackshaw. Uh, it's a lecture, Professor Alan Hackshaw from the UCL Cancer Institute. It's a lecture entitled Cigarettes, the most successful product ever. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I wasn't sure whether the title was going to market cigarettes, because I used the word successful product ever. Um, I've got a feeling it is, after all these years of research, it's still heavily ingrained in practice. Um, a friend of mine in Italy a few weeks ago went to see his doctor with some minor heart palpitations, and his equivalent his GP said to him, um, I think it's stress that's the problem with you. He then went into his pocket and pulled out a cigarette and said to him, I think you should take some of these and that will calm you down. <laughs> this was his doctor during a consultation in 2013. How can this not be the most successful product ever? So what I'm going to cover um, is I'm not going to talk about cancer and heart disease because everybody knows what that's about, but I'm going to give the, uh, the bigger picture of the tobacco problem and touch on some disorders that aren't so well known and also what happens next or what should happen next. So here, let's create a new product. If this were to be a new product now with these attributes, they look really good. It can relieve stress, so even doctors still think it does so. It gives you pleasure, it can enhance your socialising, look and make you feel more confident. These are all features that most people want to have. So if you've got a product that can make you have these features, then excellent. So it looks like we're on a roll with these products. These are iconic photographs from when I was growing up many years ago. Um, the, the people inside the pictures might have changed, but the look of them haven't. And if you go elsewhere in the world, they look very similar. So there's Marble Man, and there's Lauren Bacall, who I always think of smoking a cigarette almost every time I see her in a film. Um, Again, how do you get this innocuous looking thing being attractive, make you feel sexy, whether you're a man or a woman? There's not many products that can do that, by the way, and it's all from branding. Look how small this thing is, but look at those two. Look at, when you look at the imagery of it, and this is what the tobacco industry relies on all throughout the years to make you think you can look like one of these two people. Um, remember Marva Man, I'm going to mention him later on. Look how fit and healthy he looks. <laughs> so consumers, you've created this product that makes lots of people feel really well. Um, how popular could it be? Well, this is how popular it is. It's one billion smokers in 2010. That's one in five of the world's population. It's absolutely huge. Um, 800 million men and 200 million women. Um, and in many countries, the prevalence of smoking in women is going up. This is what the tobacco industry says a few years ago. If you can market a product that kills people, you can market anything. Do you agree? <laughs> I, mean, I think so. Again, I, st I still think this is the most successful product ever. Um, and this is, only in this is not in the 1980s or 1990s. This is only 2003. So even then, the tobacco industry knows that there are lots of mugs out there, so if you pardon my expression. But remember that, one billion smokers in the world in one year. So you've got a product, you could make it, look, make it look attractive, you can market it well. What about the money that it brings in? Well, in the UK alone, it's 15 billion pounds of revenue. That's in one country. The UK is quite good at manufacturing it, by the way, and selling it off. They can't grow tobacco, as you well know, but they're good at manufacturing and sales. In the United States, um, 8.5 billion pounds spent just on marketing and advertising by the tobacco companies, compared to only 457 million spent on tobacco control by the government. So just by looking at the disparity between what the industry spends and what governments do to try to counteract that is absolutely huge. This is what I find staggering. The largest six tobacco companies, their revenue and profits. Okay, look at the scale. So this, is the, this is in one year alone, by the way. If this was looking at millions, you'd think quite a successful company, wouldn't you? The scale is not in millions, it's in billions of dollars. It's absolutely huge. 
So even after decades of tobacco research, and everybody knows about smoke, and, what, and everybody knows a smoker, I'm still staggered by the scale of this product and how many people use it, and also how much money it makes the companies that produce it. So this is just the six biggest tobacco companies. The one that is more startling, as you can see, is the one right on the right, one from China. It's 90, almost $92 billion revenue. That's where the tobacco companies are marketing. And I and others, when I started working in smoking about 20, 22 years ago, people, we, thought, we, knew, we knew then that's what the future is for tobacco. It's not in the UK or Europe or America. It's in the developing countries where health education is not so good as it is here. So total revenue of those six companies, $346 billion. It's, it's mind-boggling. $35 billion of profits. So that should be dollars. The profit from those six tobacco companies is the same as the combined profits from McDonald's, Microsoft, and Coca-Cola in that one year alone. And if you think how common those products are, well, tobacco is even more popular. And just to put it in the scale of things, the amount of revenue that those six companies made was not far off from the gross domestic product of Venezuela, a whole country. So th these big numbers I, I find still truly startling after all these years. So th that's, what, that's what this product has done. It's been marketed incredibly well. Um, their lawyers, their marketing people, I think, are amongst the best, if not the best in the world from any organization because of the product they have to deal with. Um, but at what cost? They're expensive, and in many countries, the cost of the cigarettes is getting higher and higher. So in the UK, for example, a, a smoker who smokes about 15 to 20 cigarettes per day, and that's what an average smoker smokes, can spend easily two to 2,600 pounds a year. That's not a negligible amount of money at all. Um, there's a clear social divide um, between um, rich and poor, and I'll show this a bit more. Um, here's a study in New York where they found that 25% of the income spent by low-income workers is spent on buying cigarettes. That's a huge amount of your salary if you're not earning very much in the first place. And again, it's another part of societies, whether in developed or developing countries, where the tobacco industry tries to focus. Um, it's not people who know about the health aspects so much, but people who don't know as much. So this is, these are some results from the UK. This is the average tobacco duty paid per household um, over time from 1995 to the year 2010. And here we're looking at people in the bottom fifth of incomes, so they're the poorest ones in society, versus the ones from the top fifth of incomes. They're the richest ones in society. And as you can see, that blue curve has gone steadily down over time, such that between 1995 and 2010, the richest people are now spending 31% less on cigarettes, but the poorest people have only reduced their spending by about 14%. So a huge difference between the very rich and the very poor um, in the UK, and you'll see this pattern in other developed countries as well. So over time, people have been smoking less. There have been fewer smokers. Um, but people, people who are richer are smoking even more or less than ones who are not so rich. So here are the health effects. I'm not going to go into cancer and heart disease, I said. But here's a statistic that's well, fairly well known. It's half of lifelong smokers die from their habit. Not die from heart disease, cancer, and a whole range of things, but they die from those things, plus other stuff as well but half of them die because of their smoking habit. And many of them die in middle age. And middle age now really is, is in your, is your 30s and 40s, up to your 50s. Um, and one in five deaths in the UK alone is due to cigarette smoking. So 100 to 120,000 a year. So if you think of that half, it's, it's like playing Russian roulette with three bullets. So none of us here would even play Russian roulette with one bullet. I should hope not. So if you imagine playing Russian roulette, but putting three bullets in, so you start smoking from the age of, say, 16, 18 years old, and you get to 50, 55 years old, you spin the wheel of the gun, and then you press. 
That's what cigarette smoking is like. So I'm not trying to be too much of a scare tactic, but these are very well-established figures. In the world, in worldwide, completely, there are six million deaths in 2011, and 80% of those deaths were from the low and middle-income countries. So as I said a few minutes ago, this is where the big tobacco companies are starting to focus their efforts. To put it into the scale of things in terms of what else, what other, I suppose, bad habits you can have and whether you die from it or not, this is over 2004 to 2000, 2000 and 2004, so over a five-year period in the UK. This is the number of deaths attributable to three habits. So you have smoking, alcohol, and drugs. And that drugs is all drugs, including illicit drugs. So tiny number down there. I'm not advocating drugs, by the way. I'm just telling you the scale of things. <laughs> so drugs is just, you can barely see it on this scale. It's just down at the bottom. Then you've got alcohol, and that's 25,000 is the minimum, maximum 200,000. So even the upper estimate of the amount caused by alcohol drinking is only 200,000 deaths in that five-year period. And look at the number due to cigarette smoking. It's way at the top. It's way bigger than anything else you can imagine. So what else, what else does smoking do for you? Well, if you continue throughout your whole life, you lose on average by about 10 years of life. This is a famous study called the British Doctor Study. Um, the UK is in a good position in that in the early 1920s and 1930s, most of the population smoked, and it was the first country where most of the population smoked, and then in the 60s and 70s, most of the population quit smoking. So UK figures are a good way of looking at what happens when lots of people continue smoking for long periods of time and what happens when they quit, and I'll show you that later on. So that red, red curve is the death rate for people who've never smoked cigarettes, and that blue curve is the curve for people who've been lifelong smokers all the way throughout. And as you can see, from about the age of 50, that's when cancer and heart disease starts to kick in. Um, and as soon as you hit 50, the risk starts to separate out. So people start to die off much quicker if, you're, if you continue to smoke compared to ones who've never smoked a single cigarette. So on average, you can lose by about 10 years of life. Many smokers, if not most smokers, I know I've got friends who are smokers, think that their risk of any disease is proportional to how much they smoke. So everybody, you all know the smoker that says, oh, I only smoke one cigarette a day, or I only smoke a few, so I think it's okay. That only applies to cancer. With cancer, there's a linear line between risk and how much you smoke. But there isn't for heart disease and probably stroke. And this is what I'm going to be looking at next over the next year or so. So as you smoke more, the risk of you getting heart disease jumps. It doesn't go up slowly, it jumps a lot. And then it starts to level off. Whereas with cancer, it looks more like a straight line, and then it levels off much later. And heart disease and stroke are two, one of the most, two of the most common disorders you can get, as well as cancer. So here's, let's quantify what the effect is. So this is the effect of smoking one or 20 cigarettes a day on getting heart disease. Um, and you, because heart disease risk changes with your age, it's, it, here it is by age group, 45, 55, 65, and 75. So if you smoke one cigarette a day, okay, that's one, your risk of getting heart disease is almost double that compared to a never smoker. So that's where that relative risk of 1.93 is. If you smoke 20 cigarettes a day and you're aged 55, your risk of getting heart disease is three times greater, hence the relative risk three. So let's put the two risks in comparison with each other. The risk of smoking, the risk of getting heart disease if you smoke one a day is 20% of 7% of the risk if you smoke 20 a day. Okay? So if you smoke one cigarette versus 20, that's 5%. And most people think, I'm only going to have 5% of the risk. It's not true with heart disease and, and I think, stroke. It's not 5%. It's 27% of the risk if you're aged 45. But as soon as you get to 55 or 65, it's, the risk is much higher. Um, just to put it into context, that, that relative risk of, in those two columns 
For lung cancer, it's about 20. Okay, so you're 20 times more likely to get lung cancer if you smoke than if you don't smoke. But for heart disease, even heavy smokers, their relative risk is only four to five times greater than a non-smoker. Um, so smoking one a day actually gives, that's where you get a lot of your risk. And then as you smoke more than that, then you get some more. But then it's not just a small amount of risk on smoking one a day. So this is one fact that many smokers don't realize. So as well as this extraordinary high risk of getting heart disease for smoking very few cigarettes a day, there's a whole host of other disorders that smokers can get that are chronic. So that most people focus on the serious and fatal ones, ones that are going to kill you. There's a whole range of things that aren't going to kill you, and they're going to be chronic disorders that you, live, you have for most of your life. So just to give you a flavor of some of these, um, just a few slides of them. These are some gastrointestinal disorders. You've got peptic ulcer. Um, so you've got a 100% increase in risk if you're a lifelong smoker compared to if you are a non-smoker. So in 100,000 smokers, one could expect 440 of those to be due to peptic ulcer. You've got Crohn's disease. You've got gallbladder disease. Psoriasis for the skin. Um, once you get it, quite a lot of adults do get that, and it's quite difficult to get rid of. Um, so 40% increase for men, 150% increase for women. Um, and in every 100,000 smokers, those who do get psoriasis, 730 could be due to smoking, and 2,000 if you're a woman. So I don't want to go through these numbers in great detail, but just, just to give you a flavor of the range of chronic disorders that you can get if you smoke. So you've got neurological disorders, Alzheimer's. Many years ago, people thought that smoking cigarettes was protective against Alzheimer's, i.e. that the more you smoke, you are less likely to get Alzheimer's. It's not true. It's the way those studies were analyzed and interpreted. Smoking cigarettes actually increases your chance of getting Alzheimer's. One of the few things it does protect against is Parkinson's, but um, you don't want to think, I want Parkinson's at the expense of other things. Hip fracture, quite common in elderly women, um, and elderly women who smoke are particularly prone to getting hip fractures. You've got type 2 diabetes, you've got overactive thyroid, periodontitis, things with the teeth. And there's almost every body system that you can think of is affected by smoking in some way. And there's no big surprise, considering that smoking has got 6,000 chemicals in it. Um, it's bound to give you something very nasty, if not several things. And smoking can directly harm other people around them. Um, the smoking ban came into place a few years ago, and it's based on the evidence on lung cancer, a 25 to 30% increase in risk, and for heart disease, 30% increase in risk. But plausibly, any disorder that active smoking causes, a non-smoker can get if they're regularly exposed to passive smoke. Okay? So it's not just heart disease and lung cancer, which is what most people um, think of, but it's any disorder that I've listed, plus all those other cancers you can plausibly get. Um, the thing with smoking, you, risk goes up and it goes down. So if you're passively smoked, you're, you're, still having some do you're still having a dose, and that dose doesn't mean no risk, it means some risk, even if it's a small risk, but it still means you're going to have a slightly higher risk than someone who's not exposed to any passive smoke whatsoever. One thing I was quite astounded by was the number of women who still smoke during pregnancy, even after all these years. Um, so um, myself and Sadie, I see in the audience, did a very large systematic review on smoking and birth defects a couple of years ago. And as we looked into this, we, we looked at the statistics behind it. In the UK, one in seven women, pregnant women, smoke during pregnancy. Again, it's a startling statistic um, in this day and age. And again, it's a, it's a, it's a social inequality divide, again, the smoking. And it's less than 20 years old. Oh, I should go to the next one. And it's what, routine and manual work. Many more of those smoke compared to those in manual, so in those in managerial professional, professional jobs. And there's also a big age gap. Lots of young women and young girls smoke compared to um, older women. Um, so one that I found most surprising was women aged under 20 years old, 45% of those smoked during pregnancy. Okay, it's, it's a huge number. So some common outcomes of pregnancy is miscarriage, perinatal deaths where the baby has died 
just before, sometime just before pregnancy, premature births and low birth weights. And these aren't minor disorders. They can be quite stressing um, to the woman and, and her partner. And these are not minor in terms of the number of cases that smoking has caused. So the number of miscarriages, it's, it's going to be 5,000 caused by smoking each year in the UK, um, 19,000 with low birth weights. So it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. So is it not heart disease and can cancer, which are common as well, these are also just as common in some respect. Um, and one thing we found is the whole range of birth defects, and many of these are lifelong defects, um, which you can't fix so readily. Um, so there's something called gastroschisis, where parts of the abdomen protrudes from the baby's stomach, um, which is not so easy to fix. Hernia, where the skull doesn't fuse properly. Clubfoot, missing or deformed limbs and legs. Um, a whole range of defects um, caused by smoking. So some milestones over the 50 years. So that's why the product is so good, why it's bad, but going through some things that you might not have known, or known about, and some milestones over the 50 years. Um, over the years, most countries put a huge effort into tobacco control, and I've just picked out a, small, a smattering of them, ones that I thought were quite interesting. So 1962 and 64, the US and the UK came out with their first official government health reports, alarming people about the health hazards of smoking. Um, then not so long afterwards, 1965, the UK, I thought, was actually quite advanced for banning smoking on television. It took other countries longer than that before they started to ban, ban it on TV. But the UK were very quick off the mark soon after that first report came through. Um, and in 1971, an organisation called ASH started, wonderful name, of course. Um, there have been many other organisations, such as ASH, um, but I particularly picked on ASH because they are so good at their research and getting information out there, both in the UK and internationally. And they are the ones that they're, they're quite a thorn in the tobacco industry's foot. Um, the US Food and Drug Administration came out and approved nicotine gum in 1984. The reason I raised that was the tobacco industry were very much against it, for obvious reasons, and they actively tried for that not to be licensed. But it's good that it was licensed because it's one of the effective ways for people to stop smoking. 1997, remember Marlborough Man in the beginning, the healthy looking thing? He died of lung cancer. So it's not a milestone, so I put it up there just to make sure it's not a good thing. It was quite sad and it's quite ironic in the same way. But here's their front man for a, cigarette, for a product that probably eventually killed him in the end. Um, and then finally in 2005, again, it's seven years ago, this thing called the WHO Convention on Tobacco Control, a huge international concerted effort to get tobacco habits down internationally. So some other general achievements. Non-smoking is now considered the norm. I mean, everyone now thinks this is obvious. If you go back 10, 15 years, that's not the case at all. And smoking is very acceptable in many places. Smoking is now unacceptable in most places. And you see people's eyebrows raised when someone does pull out a cigarette. Most smokers now want to quit. Lots of restrictions on where people can smoke. Advertising bans. Most packets have got cigarette warnings on them. And the combination of that and other important tobacco control policies have avoided a large number of people dying. If the UK population and the US and Europe carried on the way they did, you'd have a lot more than 100,000 deaths per year. Um, so even though it's still a large number, it's, it's a, a large number that's been avoided in the first place. So how have smoking habits changed over time? It's changed a lot from 1974 to 2010. So it's more than halved in both men and women. But it's, without sounding like a teacher, it's still not good enough. You've still got one in five of the population that are active smokers. So this is the bit that we need to improve and find ways of improving that. It's too, it's too much. And the reason is, if you do stop smoking, it does work. And in fact, any age that people stop smoking, you get some benefit. So the younger people stop, the greater the benefits. But even if a lifelong smoker decides to stop in their 50s and 60s, they can still get some benefit. If you look at the curve at the bottom, um, that blue curve are people who continue smoking throughout their life. That red curve are lifelong non-smokers. 
And as you can see, that curve in the middle, the dashed blue line, those are ones who quit. So their risk will never be the same as a never smoker, but it's still going to be better than someone who continues to smoke. So any age of quitting is worthwhile. Um, so when people say, well, it's too, I'm too old now to quit, it's not really a good reason. Um, you can still get benefit, health benefits from it at the end. So what next? The tobacco industry are absolutely stunning at how they market the product. I, I'm still, after 20 years in the business, amazed at what they do. And they find new, innovative ways of keeping the tobacco product in people's minds and keep it looking attractive. It needs to be more government funding for tobacco control. Even though it's quite a lot at the moment, it's probably not big enough. And don't forget, prevention is better than cure. It's much better to stop people from smoking in the first place such that they don't get those disorders later on in life to which most governments then have to treat. And governments particularly have to focus the developing countries where the tobacco epidemic is increasing, so a lot of those deaths you will see in the future will increase even more in places like South America, China and India. China published its anti-smoking plan last year because they were not told to, but they felt obliged to because they were part of this WHO framework. They want to reduce their prevalence by 28% to 25%. It's not a huge number, but you might think, well, it's a very large country, so it's a lot of smokers. Um, but they're not taking the advice of, this, of the WHO organisation. They're going their own way. So we're, not, we're a bit doubtful on how effective this is going to be. 300 million smokers in, in China alone. And this is why it's going to be an uphill struggle in China. Remember there was an earthquake in China a few years ago in the Sichuan region. A year later, the tobacco company sponsored and set up 100 schools. Okay? Um, can you see those, those Chinese lettering? The first line means genius comes from hard work. Well, that's quite good, isn't it, for your young children? Yes? Very happy. Second line means... Tobacco helps you to be successful. <laughs> so this is on the front of the school in 2009. So when the children come into school, these are the two phrases they see. You, need to be, you can be good at what you do, but to help you to be good at what you do, smoke. So can you think how wonderful the tobacco companies are, but also the, like I said, the idiocy of the local government that allowed this to take place in the first place? So what an uphill struggle tobacco control policymakers have in developing countries when you've got this still being done in this day and age. This is, so this is Australia. So their cigarette packets have been shortlisted for the Design of the Year Award. So look at the packets. Tell me what you think. What do they look, what, what do they look like? What's missing from the packets? It's the branding. Okay? It's very, so the, the make of the cigarette company is hidden. And these packets have been deliberately designed to look unattractive, unappealing, and they actually did market research that showed that olive green is the least attractive colour for customers. So they really put it on thick here, which is why it was selected to be a design product of the a design board of the year, because it's encompassed all these things. And some people actually think it looks quite beautiful because it gives you so much information and it takes away all the appeal. Um, but if you compare this to the previous slide where you've got tobacco, it makes you successful, you can see the disparity in the world today and where we are. <laughs> what next? The Royal College of Physicians suggested access to other nicotine products. This is not ideal, of course. So things like snus that you can get in um, parts of Sweden. Um, but those other nicotine pr products are much safer than cigarettes. So if people can't kick their nicotine habit, rather than carrying on and smoking, find a much safer alternative and hopefully wean them off later on. More protection for children of smokers. I still commonly see ch ch small children with their parents standing over them, puffing, blowing the smoke at them, more often than I should be seen, really. And that goes back to that figure of where you've got 40% of 45% of young women who smoke during pregnancy. They're going to smoke during pregnancy and they're going to smoke afterwards as well. Better coordinated cessation, cessation programs are required 
for tobacco control. Um, and one of the areas that people are going to look at more are mental health disorders, where the smoking prevalence is quite high, much higher than the general population. And more smoke-free policies, in, especially in developing countries. But this can only come by local governments and the, the big governments supporting these tobacco control policies. More legislation and restrictions. So you might say, oh God, more laws like we haven't got enough already. Um, but they do, they do work. And when you've got a huge problem such as tobacco smoking, you need radical ideas. If you go back 15 years, the thought of having a smoking ban most, in most places would seem quite unreal. Now that everyone accepts it, it's been part of the norm. So you need radical thinking now for, to, for things to be accepted as normal in the future. Um, did the legislation on, in the UK affect businesses? Because you had lots of people saying that it would. And of course, the tobacco industry said it would. It didn't. So the UK Department of Health did some surveys. And they actually found that the effect on businesses and licensed businesses had more of a positive impact than a negative one. Um, and if, whenever you see those studies where the two things, those two columns are switched the way around, guess who funds those? The tobacco company. But when you have an unbiased study on what the effects of legislation is, there's a consistency that the businesses have done better or there's been no change. But very few of them said they've done worse. So the final slide, two ultimate goals. More and more smokers to quit and discourage people from taking up the habit in the first place. And only with those two together can we stop this, this, this huge number of deaths and also morbidity um, that's going to get higher and higher in developing countries. So National No Smoking Day was yesterday. You may or may not have realized. I, I didn't see much of it on the TV. And World No Smoking Day in um, a few months' time. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Alan. Yes, there is time for questions. Is there any questions coming now? And when yes. you ask the question, can you hang on to the microphone to? Uh, yeah. Can you hang on to the microphone to get to you? Uh, how much do you think uh, the Western government are responsible for encouraging the um, tobacco smoking in third world countries? And you mentioned China too. I'm not sure actually. I'm, I think a lot of the manufacturing now for China is done in China. Um, in terms of the UK government, I'm, I, I'm not sure. They're supposed to be very. They're supposed to be anti-smoking. Um, but even Australia, which is very anti-smoking, the tobacco industry still has quite a, quite a sway, it's still quite powerful. So I imagine there's some effect here in the UK with the tobacco companies on UK legislation. So I think things could have, the smoking ban, for example, probably could have been quicker. Um, but in terms of their impact elsewhere, I'm, 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 I don't know. I hope it's minimal. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. That was very interesting and endorsed everything I felt. Um, when I was young, there used to be smoking in cinemas, and if you mention anything, there would be something equivalent to road rage. Um, and then I noticed when they stopped people smoking in restaurants and they kept one or two tables, and you would mention, oh, could you stop smoking? I have a child with me. There'd be another road rage. Um, the question I wanted to ask, when I, I've always hated smoking. I did smoke for one year. My last year, when I was doing my undergraduate law degree, we all smoked like crazy, and then I stopped. Um, and I, I had a theory, this was my question, but I had a theory that if you buy a packet of cigarettes, this is how I stopped, and then threw that packet away, rather than saying, I'll stop when I finish the cigarettes. That was the best way to stop. The question, which I rambled a bit, is consultants, when um, somebody's dying of lung cancer, they always tell the family, oh, it's nothing to do with smoking. And that's why I found your talk so refreshing. You were not saying that. 
I have friends who smoked all their lives and they've got arthritis. One of my best friends, her, um, she's the same age as me. She only goes up and down the stairs three times a day as her exercise. Another one smokes all her life. She goes to bed with a bog roll every night, has to sit up. And yet when I used to say stop, they'd say, oh, on your bike, go away, I'm not interested. How, you know, it was really refreshing to hear you actually come out with... Sorry, I went on to... No, it's fine. It's, it, it's, it's, I think it's quite... Start, I mean, if, if someone does get lung cancer, you can't say for sure it is due to your smoking, but the chances are that it, 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 it actually is. Um, and that's the thing. It, it's not just cancer and heart disease. There's a whole host of other things and the chronic disorders that you can get as well at the same time. Did you mention arthritis? No, I, I just put a smattering of ones up here. That, that arthritis, I'm sure, would be one of them as well. Question there. Um, you mentioned links to, or potential links to mental illness, um, smoking. I was just wondering what um, what mental illnesses might uh, it, there might be a causal link to. There's some evidence that it, um, for anxiety. People think that smokers think that it, it, it's better for stress. There's actually some evidence that it can make you more anxious. For example, um, there's a link between schizophrenia, um, postpartum depression. Um, there's a Royal College of Physicians report coming out um, later this year that I was involved in, and that's going to su summarise it all. So there's, there's actually quite a few. Um, but that, it's been an area that people have ignored so long because people in mental care homes, for example, even though the prevalence might be as high as 40%, 50%, the view was, well, it helped it help keeps them calm. Um, well, it might help them feel calm, but then you've got all these other disorders they might get as well. The next question is just over there. Oh, sorry. Yes, there are, and they're, and they're going to be summarised in this, in this report this year. Fine, and that one over there. Could you be more specific from your vantage point on what might usefully be done in the UK to uh, reduce smoking further? For example, uh, given your emphasis on the tobacco companies, should there be a directed um, initiative against their activities? And again, for example, there seems to be a shift of smoking from banned environments to the periphery, for example, railway stations and doorways of workplaces. Uh, and a further idea, could the litter associated with cigarette ends be a basis for targeted measures? I think all of those, when, when, when um, the smoking ban was first developed several years ago, and I, and I was partly involved in that as well, the thought of banning smoke in parks, for example, I thought, well, how weird. Why would you ban smoke in a, in a public area such as that? But you put in the, when I think of it now, it's, it probably makes sense. It's, it's, it's to stop smoking everywhere, really, and to help smokers to think, well, it's, it's not so easy to smoke in lots of these places. Um, in terms of other policies, you could, the price of cigarettes could probably, it can still go up. Um, there is a direct relationship between, as the price gets higher, people smoke, they're, they're smokers or they smoke less. Um, so even though you think a pack of cigarettes might be expensive now, it can still go higher. In fact, in real terms, a pack of people are still spend, people are spending as much as they were many years ago. So you, you need to outprice it um, is, is one of the ways. Um, and the protection for children is, a, is another one. So trying to stop people from smoking in cars that carry kids is, might be another way that I thought was too radical a couple of years ago. But again, I now see as not something in its own right, which might look strange, but as a whole package of, of policies. Um, the question over there. Um, do you not think there's a danger um, in putting up the price of cigarettes when a lot of people in low-income families um, are buying those? Sort of a danger of putting the price up and the parents will still buy them, but children sort of do less well, have less money to spend oh. on them. <laughs> That is, that, that is, a, that is a, an issue. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, the, I'm sure there might be evidence of it, um, but they, 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 we do know that as you put the price up, people do quit. But, so there's going to be a balance between how much do people quit and how much do the children, for example, suffer. Um, I mean, one question could, you could ask is how high could it go um, before people think it's so high, I really can't afford this, I need to um, buy clothes and food um, for the family. Um, I don't think anyone's really pushed the limit yet. And tobacco, I think it's one example where the tobacco companies do try and keep the price back. It's time for just that one more. Let's just say. Yeah. 
Hello. Thank you very much. I just wondered whether you include in your research other forms of tobacco, cigars, pipe smoking, because you haven't mentioned those at all. <laughs> Same thing applies to cigars. Yeah, cigarettes was the most common one. Um, it, it still applies to cigars and, and pipe smoking. Do you include those in your um, They usually are, yes. So when you, whenever you see smoking, it usually means all forms of smoking, and they specifically say it states cigarette smoking. I, I'm sorry, I have to close it now. We have to yeah. exit by five minutes too. So just for me to thank you very much indeed, Alan, Alan for a data-loaded uh, <laughs> case. Thank you very much indeed.